Hello, my name is Matt Stregler from Stanford, and this is the second part of our lecture on the management and evaluation of burn patients. So let's get started. Returning to our case of our 10-year-old boy who had a scald burn from a hot liquid. We did our initial evaluation, making sure that his airway was protected and not involved. And we're at our now our re-evaluation. We're going to re-evaluate, think, and act simultaneously in this patient. And remember, when we re-evaluate the patient, we're dividing those into the patients that are potentially sick and those that are obviously, or at least they don't appear to be sick. And in the potentially sick or unstable patients, we're going to be performing a more rapid evaluation while we think about our differential diagnosis and our and our actions to further work up and stabilize that patient. So our sample history in this patient was we had a 10-year-old boy with a scald burn. It occurred approximately 30 minutes prior to the patient's arrival at the emergency department. The pain is made worse by touching it. It's a burning sensation. It appears to be over his thorax, the back of his neck and head, and his right shoulder and arm area. The pain is fairly severe and they deny any other injury, especially traumatic injury in this patient. The remainder of our sample history is unremarkable in this healthy 10-year-old. His last meal was four hours ago. I do ask uh, other events that occurred and I try to focus this on how this uh, uh, how this accident or injury happened. And the parents say that the mother tripped and spilled the liquid onto the patient from a pot while cooking. In burn patients, there's a few other key points on history that I like to focus on that we don't always include in our classic sample history. First of all, what was the exposure time? Whether it's a fire or a scald burn, we want to know how long was that patient exposed to that, uh, that heat? And the type of liquid is important for this because obviously things like oil or tar increase the exposure time compared to like water. We also want to know whether the patient had any heavy or thick clothing on because I'll knit Although initially that can protect the patient, if that clothing gets hot, it then stays and keeps that heat against the skin and increases our exposure time. We want to know is the burn painful and what parts and how painful is that burn because that's going to help us determine the burn depth. Make sure you focus on other associated traumatic injuries, especially in patients that ha underwent a fire or explosion. The burns can be quite dramatic, but if the patient, uh, if you don't evaluate that patient for other traumatic injuries, you're going to miss something and something that could confuse the diagnosis of what's going on early. You want to determine if this was an accident. About a third or so of burns in the United States are in children, and a significant percentage of these are non-accidental trauma or abuse. And so start listening to the story and determining does this story make sense with what I see on exam. And then if it's a fire, you want to know was the patient inside and indoors or were they outside? And what was their mobility? Are they elderly or uh, have a disability where they have limited mobility or a child or a baby? That's going to increase their exposure time both to the burn itself and any toxic gases or fumes. So as we evaluate this patient, we move from history to our focused physical exam. And obviously, the overriding thing that we're going to pay attention to on the physical exam is the skin exam, because that's going to help us determine the, the severity of the burn. But there's a few other systems we want to make sure we cover the face and eyes because that's going to be a common area where we're going to have injuries to the eyes or face is going to put us at risk for airway burns. We're also going to want to make sure we do a brief neuro exam which we'll talk about more in a few minutes. And then we'll want to do a lung exam. Injury to the lower airway from a burn is uncommon except in situations where there's steam. But you should still 
evaluate the lungs carefully because there could be other toxic exposures. So let's th talk about the skin exam and assessment of the burn depth because this is very important. So the skin is, di we divide the skin into the epidermis or very superficial layer and then the dermis which contains things like our hair follicles, nerve endings, blood vessels and then our subcutaneous or deep tissues, muscle, fat, things like that. A superficial thickness burn is one of the categories of burns that we, that we think about when we think about its depth. And a superficial thickness burn is very similar to a sunburn. In this situation, only the epidermis is injured and the dermis is fine, is not injured. So these patients don't have any peeling and what you see on exam in a lighter skinned person is kind of a pink irritated uh, skin that's very blanchable. It's tender to the touch. It's normally painful, but not severely painful. And if you use what's called the pinprick test, if you prick the patient, they'll have a good sensation. It'll be painful. They would rapidly bleed if you prick them. And this is a superficial thickness burn. The next category of burns are our partial thickness burns. Our partial thickness burns are divided into our superficial partial thickness and our deep partial thickness. A superficial par partial thickness burn extends past the epidermis into the dermis. So it's going to involve some of the blood vessels, the nerve endings, and the hair follicles, but it's not going to go all the way through the dermis. In these cases, you'll frequently see a wet pink area uh, of burn in contrast to our superficial thickness, which will generally be dry. On a pinprick test, it will be painful or tender. It will bleed briskly with a pinprick. The, the patient often has very severe pain in these cases. And you'll see blistering or peeling of the skin. It is blanchable, but there is some delay in the return of uh, cap re the cap refill or the um, return of blood flow to that area after you push on it and blanch it. In contrast, a deep partial thickness burn, as you can see here, is this white area. And in this case, the burn is all the way through the dermis. It's not extending into the deeper tissues, but because it goes all the way through the dermis, it injures the hair follicles, blood vessels, and the nerve endings significantly. And in these patients, in the areas of the deep partial thickness burn, they'll they'll frequently have limited sensation. So these are typically not as painful as a superficial partial thickness burn. On a pinprick test, there is some bleeding, but it's not brisk. And you generally can't blanch these. They're already kind of a white or a mottled white pink appearance. And there's, as we said, their sensation is present, but decreased. And our final category is our full thickness burn. In a full thickness burn, the burn is extending all the way through the dermis into the deep structures of the muscle or fat. These are fre frequently kind of a charred or white appearance, like the, like the um, deep partial thickness burns. They tend to be dry. And in these, in these cases, the sensation, because the nerve endings are pretty much destroyed, is gone. So most of these patients may not complain of much pain at the full thickness burn sites. And with a pinprick test, you're going to have very limited to no bleeding because the blood vessels are damaged. They're going to have very limited to no sensation as well. And these areas are not blanchable. So back to our case of our 10-year-old. What is this patient's burn depth? Well, if you look at the patient carefully, you can see on his anterior chest wall that there's clearly peeling of the skin. And with the peeling of the skin, you already know that it's either a partial or full thickness. It's not superficial, right? Because that only injures the epidermis. So we know the dermis is involved. You can also see that it's pink and white, kind of a mottled appearance. So this could be, um, a, either a superficial 
partial thickness or a deep partial thickness. And to know better, we're going to need to do a pinprick test, checking for sensation. If the patient's in a lot of pain, which this patient was, that's suggestive more of a superficial partial thickness burn than a deep partial thickness burn where more of the nerve endings are injured. But as is the case in most burns, it's not a single burn where the entire burn is one depth. There's normally a um, number of different depths spread across the patient's body. So in this patient, he very likely has some superficial part partial thickness areas and some deep partial thickness areas. Moving from the depth to the body surface area or the total body surface area that is burned. In adults, people frequently use something called the rule of nines. And the rule of nines is dividing the body into certain sections, saying that the head and neck is about 9%, the arms are about 9% each, the front and back are each 18%, the legs are each 18% as well. So they're all multiples of nines. The genitalia is the remaining 1%. This works fairly well for adults and larger children. However, it does not work well for younger children, especially those under the age of two. And in those cases, we want to use a modified rule where the head is larger and the legs are smaller relatively. So the thorax and abdomen anteriorly are each 9% or 18% the entire front, and the back is also 18%. But the head, in contrast to an adult where 9% for the entire head and neck region, in a child the entire head and neck region is considered 18%, and each of the legs is reduced from 18% to 13.5% when we're calculating the total body surface area. Another rule that can be convenient because most of the time the entire arm or entire thorax may not be burned is using the rule of palm. And this says that the patient's palm in an adult is about 1% of the body surface area. So you can evaluate or estimate the size of the patient's palm and then kind of estimate that across the patient's burn, figuring that each palm size area is about 1%. In a child, though, you should probably use the rule of hand, meaning that you not only include the size of the palm, but you include the fingers and thumb as well. So if you use the entire hand, that's about 1% of the body surface area in a child. Those are good ways of doing a rapid estimation. But after the initial stabilization, especially after the patient's been admitted, you want a better understanding of the patient's actual total body surface area. And that's where using a chart, such as a Lund-Browder burn size chart, can be useful to get you a better estimate of what that patient's burn area is. Remember though, that when you're calculating the total body surface area, we do not include superficial burns that only involve the epidermis. So if you have a patient that has some areas of superficial thickness and then some areas of partial and deep thickness, we only want to include the partial and deep thickness areas when we're calculating the to percent total body surface area that's been burned. So back to our patient. What's the total body surface area in this patient? Well, clearly, this is kind of the typical challenge that you see. You can't easily just use the rule of nines or even the rule of hand in this patient because the burn is scattered, as you frequently see in scald burns, across the body. But you could do a rough estimation, and when we're initially evaluating the patient and stabilizing the patient, a rough estimation is a good place to start. So we know that the anterior abdomen and chest is about 9% and 9% or 18% together. And we can see that probably a little bit more than half of the anterior abdomen chest area is burned. You can guess that the back of the head, neck, and right upper extremity shoulder area is burned as well. So if I had to make a rough estimate of burn in this patient, I would start with around 15%, I think is a reasonable estimate of this patient's burn.
So we've moved from our, on our focused physical examination. We also want to look at the face and eyes, and in this patient it was normal, and the lung exam was normal as well. We do want to take a moment, though, and eva talk about the neuro exam and why that's important in a patient with a burn. So in a patient with a burn, in those with a fire burns, which are most common, they're going to be at risk for some toxic exposures as well. And the biggest one, or the most common one, is carbon monoxide poisoning. So anybody with a prolonged exposure to a fire, especially those inside, or in patients with a burn from cooking or uh, heating oils inside, they're at risk for carbon monoxide exposure. And carbon monoxide exposure frequently presents with neurologic problems such as headache, altered mental status, and occasionally with some GI symptoms such as vomiting as well. But that's why it's important in our burn patient from a fire to make sure that we've done a neurologic assessment. Additionally to carbon monoxide, you can see cyanide exposure. And this is typically from a house fire or sometimes an industrial complex where there's burning plastics or building materials which can release cyanide fumes. And in a patient with a prolonged exposure, they can get cyanide toxic. So that's another reason that we want to check the patient's mental status because this will frequently present with altered mental status or neurologic dysfunction and occasionally in severe cases it can prevent with, present with cardiovascular dysfunction such as bradycardia and hypotension as well. So in summary, in the second evaluation or the second stage of evaluation of these patients, we want to determine the depth of the burn, okay, whether it's superficial or superficial partial thickness or things that are deeper meaning that they have less sensation. So that would be our deep partial thickness and our deep burns. We want to determine the total body surface area involved, but we only want to include those that are partial thickness and full thickness burns and not include superficial thickness burns. And we want to have a high suspicion for carbon monoxide poisoning or cyanide poisoning in building fires.